Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. In a moment, we will go to our study. You will see that we will not have a bulletin, but we'll go directly to our teaching, and then we'll conclude the teaching with a few words of encouragement to you who are viewing our services online. Please take the opportunity of letting us know that you're watching, and if you desire to give an offering, you can do so online. If you're watching us via computer, click on the Give button in the upper right corner of your screen. If you're watching on your mobile device or iPad, click Give under the menu button. If this is your first time giving digitally, follow the instruction under Four Ways to Give to process your gift. You can also mail your checks to 12205 North Pipeline Avenue, Chino, California, 91710. And remember, you can still come in and use the kiosks we have in the foyer that are set up to process gifts, or you can place your gift in an envelope and hand it to one of our receptionists in the foyer. Thank you. And with that, let's get into the teaching. In verse 4 of Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul is writing concerning children. And in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, he says, You fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And so, today we're going to be sharing concerning raising kids to have faith in Jesus Christ. And... As I give this particular teaching, it's intended to really encourage all of us to do our very best, we who are parents, do our very best to teach our children. And this particular teaching comes from a fellow traveler, because God knows I'm not an expert on raising children, and raising kids for me has been a difficult journey. What I want to do is just encourage all of us in some very basic things that relate to this very difficult but important task. Now, as we've been going through our series, I mentioned to you that part of God's design for marriage is to produce believing children. In the Old Testament book of Malachi, in chapter 2, verse 15, well, that verse tells us that God is seeking godly offspring. Now, when Malachi writes concerning godly offspring, godly offspring speaks of children who are born to believing parents. And the thought is that parents would be believers, and the believers would be believers in God who honor their vows to marriage as well as their promises to God. So this would encourage faith to be personally lived out, and it would encourage that faith to be given to their children. So raising children who fear and serve the Lord is a mission, but it has no guarantee of success. It's a task that is ongoing. And often, in many ways, it becomes more difficult as time passes on. And I'm not through with the task, even though all of my children today are adults. My role hasn't changed much. The job's dis job description has. So at this point, I see myself more as an observer, an occasional counselor and teacher. Sometimes we might think it's easier to be a parent over time. But I found that it was easier to minister to my children when they were very young. It was easier to take a romantic weekend when they were younger. It was easier to gather them together for their devotions. It was easier even then to correct them. But as they grew older, they required a different kind of attention. As they entered adolescence, they began developing their own thoughts, their own values. It became a challenge to let them grow and yet still be an influence in their lives. When they became adults, it was another time of transition, and I am now more hands-off. Uh, uh, being a grandparent is also a transition. And in many ways, I have taken in my family more of a patriarchal kind of role. You see, it's been said that life is a race, and, and it's a race that all of us are running in. And as I grew, I began to realize that life was more of a, a relay race, and relay races are won by a successful exchange of the baton. I was handed a baton, a baton of faith from faithful witnesses who, who handed it to me. And when I became a parent, it became my responsibility to, to pass that baton to my own children. 
You see, when I was reading and as I've read the Bible, I, I have discovered that there are many people who are in Scripture that we know by name who are godly people who had very ungodly children. You have Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve raised Cain. You have Noah, who had a son named Ham and a sister named Eggs. <laughs> Show me mercy, I'm old. You had Eli the priest. He had two ungodly sons, Hophni and Phinehas. King David had ungodly sons, Amnon and Absalom. Solomon had a son named Jeroboam. And Hezekiah had Manasseh. And you can see over and over and over again godly men who had ungodly children. Well, obviously, godly parents can have ungodly kids. But ultimately, all we as parents can do is our best, and we hold on, and we trust the Lord as we raise Him. You see, as Christians, we are to take the faith that we have in Christ and do our very best to evangelize our own kids, to give it away. In Deuteronomy 4, 9, and 10, it says, Be careful and watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them slip from your heart. As long as you live, teach them to your children and to their children after them. Remember the day you stood before the Lord, your God, at Horeb, when he said to me, Assemble the people before me to hear my words, so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land, and may teach them to their children. And so bringing children to faith in Christ is of utmost importance, and it's to be taken seriously. Raising children is a spiritual task that we work very hard at and we have to be completely dedicated to. Joshua 24 tells us in verse 15, if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's a spiritual task you have to be dedicated to it. There are those who will say, well, we're going to let our children determine their own faith when they grow up. But that reveals something of the parents' faith. It doesn't mean anything to them. They and their children will ultimately reap the consequences of a life lived without God. You see, God's Word makes it clear that parents are responsible to nurture faith in Jesus Christ. We are a continual and the greatest continual influence in their lives. So we need to exert as much godly influence as we can possibly do while we still have the ability to do so. Bringing children to faith in Christ is spiritual. It's something we work at. We need to encourage our kids to faith in the Lord over their entire lifetime. There's no guarantee of success, and that serves as a powerful incentive for us to do our best. You see, our society the society that our children are, are being born into. Our society exerts tremendous pressure to reject faith in Christ and to compromise any faith you might have. Everything about this world system works against faith in Jesus Christ. Everything. This world system encourages lust. It encourages materialism, sinful pride, arrogance. It's all part of this system that's called the world. In 1 John 2, 15 through 17, we're told, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and what he has done comes not from the Father, but from the world. And that's the system that is after your children. That is the system that relentlessly evangelizes them. And there's a continuous influence from the world to entice your kids away from the Lord. There's a, there's, there's, there are two different kinds of messages that are being poured into their lives. A message from the world and a message from the gospel. My wife Marie and I were suffering the other day in Maui. <laughs> Somebody has to. As you know, some of you may know, we went with the church and we took uh, the church to, to Hawaii. And Marie and I, my wife and I, were together. We went out for some breakfast. And uh, when we first went to Maui, the very first time we went, we were up in, in a, uh, an area called Lahaina. And in that area there, 
we stayed in a particular place and had discovered a little restaurant that is uh, just, it, it serves great pancakes, to be honest with you. And so we got up and decided to go for breakfast. And we traveled up about, it was about 35 minutes from where we were staying. We traveled up the northern, n- northwestern coast and we found this place and we went in and sat down and it, and it was playing this old music, you know, um, from the 60s. And I don't know, the atmosphere was, was I, I liked it, to be honest with you, you know, my pancakes and... Um, just, it just was, it, it was kind of a, what I would call a cool vibe. Um, just, you know, some old songs, you know, Temptations and just, just that kind of thing. And just I'm there with my girl and, and I'm enjoying that moment with her. And it's one of those moments that you really enjoy when somebody decides to turn the television set on. And it's right next to us and, and it, there's a game on some inconsequential basketball game. Neither one of the teams mattered to me. They could both lose and I wouldn't cry, you know. But they turned it on loud so the other patrons could hear. And now that sound from the television set is drowning out the sound of the music. Now I could still hear the music, but I had to concentrate just so I could continue listening to what I wanted to listen to. And as I was there, I spoke to my wife and I said, this, is, this reminds me of what the world is. You have one track that's going that you want to hear, but another track that's going that's simply a distraction. And as I thought about that, I told Marie, I said, that's like what I'm going to be teaching on with the kids and parents and raising them. There are two tracks that are going on right now. The track that you've given to your kids And that track is the gospel. And the track that the world gives to them, which is the tracks of my tears. No, it's the track. (laughs) 60s, this and that. But anyway, old people know exactly what I just said. Your younger ones are going, well, that was deep. No, it wasn't. It really wasn't. Just an old song. The tracks of my tears. But anyway. But that's what the world offers. Tears. Sorrow. Lust materialism that's what it offers and what God offers is life and that which is more abundant and it's our desire as Christian parents to give to our children that which is the foundation so that when the world comes and entices with the lust of the flesh lust of the eyes the pride of life that is in this world this God ungodly world that is a doomed uh, it's a doomed philosophy of life We're wanting to give our children the words of life. And they're dealing with so many things. I mean, think about what our kids are hearing in terms of the various soundtracks that are being played. They're they're dealing with their peer pressure. And the uh, peer pressure encourages them to do anything to fit in, to not be any different than other people. If you don't think that your kids or the young people you're around are, are being affected, speak to them about abortion. Speak to them about homosexuality. Ask them about gender fluidity. Ask them things that relate to living together. Is it wrong? Is it right? What do you know? And I'm telling you, they have been influenced by this world. They don't want to say what they may have been taught because that contradicts everything they're hearing in different places. There are sexual pressures that are bombarding them from the time they're small. It's seen in a variety of ways that they think. It's seen in the way that they dress. There are a lot of, a lot of people, male and female, who dress in a way that is really more provocative. It's really more, it's, it's actually nasty in many ways. I mean, you know, uh, you know, the yoga pants and this and that, that's nasty, man. That's, <laughs> nasty (laughs) three things tell you the truth a drunk a child and yoga pants but anyway (laughs) isn't that dumb? yes there are a lot of temptations to drug and alcohol experimentation And again, if you have a Christian child and you don't think so, ask them whether it's okay to smoke pot. Ask them if marijuana is okay and find out what they actually really believe. Violence. If violence is something that young people deal with, 
And for many, it's simply common. It's even normal. For some, it's, it's another means of entertainment. It's simply found on video games. Then you see entertainment. When it comes to entertainment, did you know that children watch over 4,000 commercials on television a year? That violent movies and video games are intentionally marketed to children and adolescents? That by the age of 18, they have seen over 18,000 murders, 9,000 violent sexual attacks, and that they have been bombarded with profanity, vulgarity, and blasphemy, and you even see that in their cartoons. There are over 160 magazines that are targeting children. One magazine came in our mail with an article on sodomy. It was targeting high school girls and was presented as a means of birth control. Young people see 45% more beer ads and 27% more ads for hard liquor in teen magazines than adults do in their particular magazines. Despite the master settlement agreement with the tobacco industry in 1998, tobacco advertising expenditures in 38 youth-oriented magazines amounted to $217 million in the year 2000. Today, technology provides instant information and immediate gratification. Many have an addiction to their phones and computers, and they have no actual friends. If you don't think so, take away the iPhone or the computer from your kid and see how they respond to that. Many of them have friends. They call friends out in the netherworld, out there with people they've never even met, but they share their hearts and their stories with these people. A growing number are introduced to pornography via the Internet, and, and many are using their phones to send pictures of themselves naked to other boys and other girls. Popular TV entertainers and TV series undermine Christian values and promote sin. Talk show hosts and movie stars educate, but they don't necessarily entertain. Many of them today think of themselves as, as political pundits, and they want to give you their advice and their thoughts on, on the world, and people will listen to them thinking, surely they have the ability to communicate these things to me. After all, they're a popular singer, or they have a TV daytime program. They must be geniuses. Well, there's a very real cosmic war that is being fought for our children's minds. And that's why it's so important to raise our kids in the knowledge of the Lord. Now, as you look at this in verse 4, notice that was your introduction. Let's get into our study. You fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Fathers have incredible influence on their children. What they like, what they think permanently affects their kids. There's no doubt about that. As I was preparing this, I was thinking of my own father's influence in my life. And as a, as a young boy, I wanted to be like my dad. And there are things that I've never really shared, uh, uh, never really had any reason to, but, but, but things that could illustrate what I'm saying when I say this. Uh, my father liked the trumpet. I don't know why, but he did. And when I grew up, he had, you know, uh, different songs that he would like. And many times they were by uh, uh, people who were playing the horn. And so, me, I, I, I had a musical aptitude and I was growing up, and, and, um, but my desire was to play drums. I liked the drums, but my dad, my dad liked the trumpet. And so when I was nine years old, I started to learn to play the trumpet. I actually played trumpet in bands in junior high into my freshman year in high school. And, and I played the trumpet because my dad liked it. And I can still remember there was a particular song that my dad liked uh, that was, I think it was called Wonderland by Night. And it was a, it's a trumpet. It's a song with, uh, that is, has a trumpet solo in it that leads. And at the age of about nine or ten, when I was learning to play the horn, I, I, I listened and listened and listened to that song so I could hear how he was playing it. And I worked and worked on it in my bedroom until I had a... Uh, uh, enough for you to recognize what I was trying to do. Obviously, there's, I wasn't a pro, you know, some prodigy with a trumpet, but I was sure trying. And then my dad was in the garage, which was only 40 feet or so from my bedroom. I opened up the window, and I stood there, actually, so he couldn't see me. I was embarrassed, but I still remember trying to play that song to my dad. 
so he could hear me trying to play something he liked. That was how much he influenced me. My, my dad was not an educated man, but my dad was a reader. And my dad, every night, as I can recall as a, a kid, every night I would go to say goodnight to him in his room, and he'd have the Reader's Digest. And you know, to this day, I have the Reader's Digest. My wife got a subscription to it, and I have the Reader's Digest. My dad loved the Rams, and now I have reason to also. <laughs> no, I grew up with the Rams. You know, my dad was a Rams fan. We used to call them the lambs for so long, but now they're the rams, right? And so, but my dad liked the rams, and so I grew up liking the rams. My dad loved the Dodgers, and I loved the Dodgers. My son loves the Dodgers. His son loves the Dodgers. You know, I can't even say to my, my granddaughter, Bella, you know, you're such an angel, because she'll say, I hate the angels. <laughs> that, that's my daughter. It's the truth. And, and my, my little David's the same way. Baby David's the same way. The, you know, but I can remember when the Dodgers moved to L.A. from Brooklyn. I remember that. And my dad took me to one baseball game in my life, and I still remember that game as I went to the Coliseum and watched the Dodgers play for the first time and became a lifelong fan of the Dodgers. That was my dad's influence. Now, my dad took us to the L.A. Auto Show, and uh, I still remember he only took us once. But I still remember going to the L.A. Auto Show with my dad. And now, my, my boys, I raised my boys going with dad to the L.A. Auto Show. There's no harm in looking because I'll never help you buy one of those. <laughs> but look, we, we were just there just the other day, you know, with my boys. You know, we go. Why? Because my dad took me. And those are things that have stayed with me. My, my dad took his credit very personally. My dad worked hard. My dad loved his wife. My dad cared for his kids. These are things that I learned by watching. And then he'd say things like, take care of your credit, David. Your name's the most important thing that you have. Take care of your health, son, because if you, if you get sick, you can't work. If you, if you can't work, you can't provide for your family. Those were the things my dad not only told me, those are the things my dad did because my dad would be on vacation and my mom would say to my dad, don't answer the phone because the phone was ringing. They would say, Frank, can you come in? And my dad would leave vacation to go to work. And so my mom would get upset because dad was that kind of man. He got up and, and the, I said, remember him leaving every morning at seven, coming home every morning, every evening rather, at, at seven, I, uh, like a clock. That was my father. And I saw his work apps. I, I saw what he did with his credit and all. When, when we went to the um, L.A. show back in the early 60s, I still remember this. I remember going to my dad. And at that time, uh, you actually had... Uh, you had uh, little stages, small stages, and they would have forms of entertainment. I still remember walking with my dad uh, uh, past this one stage with some young men playing music, and I think it might have been 1962, and we were walking by, and, there was the, they were, and it was the only auto show he ever took me to, but I still remember this, and I looked at this band playing. I wasn't really impressed that much with them, but later on, I found out it was the Beach Boys, and the Beach Boys were doing that. They were from Hawthorne, and they were there in the area doing some music, getting some attention. And then they wrote a song, Don't Worry Baby. And I told my dad, I really like that song. And I still remember the only song my dad ever went and bought and gave to me was by the Beach Boys, Don't Worry Baby. See, these are things that I tear up remembering. I tear up. Your father makes an impact in a way that no other man can. Your daddy does. Your dad. And he wasn't my big buddy, my big playground friend. Hey, dad, you're home from work. Let's play catch. Are you kidding? My dad would come home from work, and it was like a, a conquering general was arriving. You know, my mom would say, hey, quiet down, dad's home. <laughs> Don't bother him. He loves you, but he may kill you. Let him go. My dad had to go into the bathroom the minute he came home every night. And he would wash his face, wash his hands. Then he'd be ready to put up with us. That was my dad. So today we have a lot of men who want to be their kid's playground buddy. He, he, he doesn't need a buddy. You know, if you can play catch, that's fine. But don't beat yourself to death if you can't. 
My dad didn't come and watch me, me play ball. He didn't watch me in, in track. He didn't watch me do any of the things that I did. But he's still my father. And when he could, I valued those moments. But I knew he was working hard for the family. So that I didn't cry myself to sleep at night because daddy didn't see me hit that home run. I didn't cry because he wasn't there when I was in that concert. I, that, that didn't matter because my father, my father was not my buddy. My father was the authority in the house. He was the man, and I respected him. And that's how I was raised. I didn't expect to hear from him every moment things of making me feel number one. I expected my father to be authority, to be the man, to help me to become a man like him. He wasn't a big kid. He wasn't my adult friend. He was my father. Now, Paul commands fathers to not provoke their children to wrath. They are to wield authority. They're to bring discipline into the home. And, uh, and, and when you're young, it's easier for the father to do that. You discipline them, but you don't abuse them. So we are careful what we say to them. We are careful how we correct them. And when we do correct them, we do so because we love them, not because they got on our last nerve, not because they're interrupting what I want to do when I'm resting, but when we correct them, it's because we love them. Like it says in Proverbs 13, 24, if you refuse to discipline your children, it proves you don't love them. If you love your children, you will be prompt to discipline them. So he's saying this to us. He says again, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. To bring up means to nourish. Nourish them in the discipline and understanding of God. The word train speaks of instruction that increases their virtue. The word admonition speaks of appealing to their understanding, exhorting them. He's saying, Father, nourish them, instruct them, exhort them, admonish them in the ways of God. Our instructions and our examples encourage them to godly living. You see, when they're small, they're open to instruction but they learn from your example. They love you. They love you more than you could possibly understand. They hold you in the highest esteem. My son David thought I was a superman. It's so funny how he, he really did. You know, I, I used to work out a long time ago, as you can tell, a long time ago. I used to work out. But I was never a big old muscular guy. I've always tried to stay, you know, as thin as I, as I can. I weighed 167 pounds. And I used to pound the weights and this and that. And, and so I still remember my son Dave, who was probably about 9 or 10, he was little. I still remember him telling his friend, he let the, his friend into the house, and I was just kind of standing there, and he says to his friend, this is my dad. He's a power lifter. And it was this, But he thought I was Hercules. He thought I was Superman. I thought my father was Superman. I literally did, because he told me he was. And, <laughs> and my son thought that I was. But that's how they look at you. They think that you are, you are everything. And so they hold us in the highest possible esteem. We are everything. And, and they're more compliant when they're young. But that doesn't mean that they're saved. So that, that, that requires me to remember they have a nature, that a nature that is in rebellion against the Lord. And that's why you discipline them, and that's why you evangelize them. Proverbs twenty two fifteen: folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far from him. See, parents are given the command to raise children in the Lord. It is our responsibility to train up our children in the things of Jesus. It isn't the church's responsibility. It isn't the school's responsibility. It isn't our friend's responsibility to do that for us. It's not child care providers. It's not family members. It's us. The task and responsibility remains with us. But I am very grateful for a community that shares our values. I'm grateful for a community that encourages my child to remain on the right path. And with that said, I should at this point say this. For any of you who are involved in education, any of you teachers, I, from the bottom of my heart, want to say to you, 
thank you for not undermining what we're trying to do in our kids' lives. I'm grateful for Christian teachers and, and educators because they are not responsible for raising my kids, but they don't undermine, at least, what I'm trying to do. You, to succeed, we, we, we parents need to adopt the values of the kingdom. We need to establish proper priorities, and we need to hold fast to them over our lifetime. As we grow in maturity, our kids will consistently be influenced by us for good. Our lives need to revolve around how we can lead our kids into the kingdom. That requires time, sacrifice, prayer, careful education in the ways of the Lord. We Christians need to realize how important it is to raise our kids to love Jesus Christ. They grow so quickly. We give them careful attention and training while we have them. All too soon they grow up, and all too soon they leave home. And a large part of our role is over. An alarming number of children are being born to parents who are unmarried. It's producing an epidemic of fatherless children, well over 80% up to 93% in some communities. According to Michelle Castillo, reporting for CBS News in March of 2013, 44% of American women will have given birth by the time they are 25, but only 38% are married by that age. By 30, two-thirds of women will have had a child out of wedlock. 83% of first births to non-high school graduates are to unwed mothers. The biggest rise in unmarried pregnancy is among the 54% of middle American women, which include women who have graduated high school and completed some college, but do not have a degree. In this group, the average age of having their first child is 24, and they are married at 27. 58% of the first births in this group are to unwed mothers. My heart goes out to the single parents attempting to raise their babies alone. And as a church, we do what we can to be of help. Many children without married parents are ending up neglected. Some bear them, but don't raise them leaving them in unstable circumstances. I am convinced that this is the root of the rebellion we see in many today. Proverbs 30, verses 11 and 12 says, There's a generation that curses its father, does not bless its mother. There is a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet is not washed from its filthiness. I believe we're living in a time when that generation is recognizable. Verse 4 says we're to bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. As a parent, I am to channel or direct them. I am not to break their spirit. I shape it. And as a father, that's one of my primary responsibilities. In Psalm 78, verses 5 through 7, it says, He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children, that they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. I am as a father to instruct my children, who in turn are to instruct theirs. And as a father, that's been one of my greatest concerns, you see, I know I'm weak and I know I'm imperfect, but I have tried to communicate faith to my kids. Proverbs 22, 6 says it. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, he will not depart from it. So what can I do? Well, like it says, train up a child. When it says train up a child, the word train speaks of provoking them to go in a direction. But that direction is conformed to their temperament and their faith. Train up a child in the way he should go. So you're provoking them to go in the proper direction. The word train would be used in that time concerning midwives who would be attending the birth of a child and when the baby was born, they would apply date honey to the lips of a newborn and it would encourage the nursing reflex. So what we are to do is study our kids. We study our children's temperament, their skills, their gifts, and we encourage them because if you have one kid, that's one thing. When you have two, you begin to discover some things. When you have three or four or more, you discover a whole lot more. Because when you have the one child, and the child may be the kind of kid who is who's very reasonable with you and all, and then you see somebody with a, a 
couple of kids and their kids are unruly. You can have a self-righteous attitude in your back of your mind saying, oh, they just don't parent right. They're not using the techniques I do. I ought to teach them out. Well, you, ha you actually had a compliant child. But when you have a David, <laughs> when you have a child that has his own mind, and when you have one and then you have another, and you start seeing that, I have a little girl, I have a little boy. Their temperaments are different. Then you have another little boy and then another little girl and you see that there is a spectrum of temperaments. You don't do the same kind of training with all four. Each one has a different personality. Each one has a different temperament. Each has a different way. I was with my son David recently and, and his son was acting up. His son David, little David, was acting up and my son David smacked him on the bottom. And the little boy, my grandson, turned to his dad and looked at him and said, that didn't hurt. He did that. And my son looks at me and I, and I went, because that was my son David. And I said, my prayers have been answered. <laughs> you got one just like I had. Enjoy. <laughs> then I have Joseph. I look at Joseph. I just have to look at my son Joseph. And son, that disappoints me. I'm sorry, Dad. You know, different temperaments, different. You have to study your kids. You need to go to understand them, and then you encourage them. You see, when a baby was born, a Jewish mother would minister to her, her infant while she was nursing the baby. She would pray, and she would sing, and she would recite Scripture and, and do those kinds of things when the baby was very small. When the baby grew older and was able at that point to begin to speak and understand more, the father took over the responsibility. He would teach the child prayers and, and teach the child uh, basic Bible doctrine, various Scriptures. The training and the discipling uh, of that child was in the father's hands. Isaiah 38, 19, the father shall make known your truth to the children. So the training in scripture produced a conscience and developed a moral foundation. So that child was taught the commandments, thou shalt, thou shalt not. They were taught that from an early age. They knew this is right, this is wrong. That formed their conscience. It created a worldview that had God in the center. In Proverbs 4, 11 through 13, I have taught you in the way of wisdom. I have led you in the right paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hindered. When you run, you will not stumble. Take firm hold of instruction. Do not let go. Keep her. She is your life. So this taught the child that they were not the center of the universe. Today, our, our, our kids think that they are. They think they are. everything revolves around them, what they want, where they want to go, what they want to do. You got me this. I didn't ask for that. I wanted this. It's Christmas. Isn't it my birthday? You didn't give me the things that I want. How come you gave her that when I wanted that? You've heard it. I've heard it. They're the center of the universe. They think that. In, in, in earlier days, a parent would say, oh, that's not good for you. No, then they would just take it away. I can still remember my mom one day when my brother Frank and I were having ice cream and we we're little kids and, and I looked at his and, and I looked at mine and I, and I said, that's not fair. He got more than me. And my mom said, oh, did he get more ice cream than you, David? And I said, yes, that's not right. See, I was uh, already a justice warrior. That's not right. You know what my mom, mama did? Did she go and get more ice cream? And eat? No. She took mine and she took his and she put it down the sink. And she said, you complain, you don't get. How many parents do that today? Very few. What do they do? Oh, wait a minute. Let me measure that. Because according to your system of justice, this is how it should be. My mom used to use the word, tonta. <laughs> don't be dumb. Don't be dumb. I learned one time, if you complain, you don't get. It doesn't take that much. There are some mamas who will make, well, he likes this food, and this kid likes that food, and this kid likes, so she makes three different meals for those brats. <laughs> you know what? My kids didn't like Marie going to retreats because I would make one thing, and they would say, I don't like this. Mama doesn't make it for me. I say, Mama, will be back in two days. <laughs> so by then you'll be plenty hungry. 
or you'll eat this. Guess what? They ate it. Guess why? They're hungry. So they learn to play you from day one. And then they play you against one another. So what we need to remember is one simple thing. Who's, who's your daddy? No, who, <laughs> who's the parent? Who's the parent? It's real simple, isn't it? Who's the parent? It works out that way. And they need to learn that. They need to respect. They need to understand they're not the center of the world. They're simply part of it. We all together are celebrating the reality of one who is in control and is to be worshipped. We teach them that. We teach them fear and respect. We, we teach them those things by being fathers who fear and respect the Lord. In Deuteronomy 6, 1 and 2, this is the commandment. And these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. So they have a worldview produced that is founded on God's word. And we explain it and encourage them to obey. How can we accomplish this as parents? We start out as early as we can. Even if you've recently been saved, start reading. Start sharing God's word with your kids. Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4 through 9 gives us guidelines. In Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, it reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hands. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So this gives us ways to bring our kids to faith in Christ. In verse 4, we need to have a saving knowledge of God. We need to know Jesus Christ. He is our unique God. Even as it says in, 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 in that passage, the Lord your God is one. You shall love him with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. So we need to know who he is. He is our God. And we need to remember that we cannot give what we do not possess. Christianity is not simply a religion. It's a way of life. It's a relationship with God. My Christian faith is not simply because I go to a Calvary Chapel church. My faith is built on my relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And that's the real thing. That's what it is. That's its essence. And Jesus in John 17, 3 said, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It's not that you may go to this church. It's that, you may, that they may have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's the key. And so take care of your walk with God, parent. Make that your number one love in your life. Follow Christ with all of your heart. Love him. Because as it happens, he says, in, 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 he says you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. Uh, keep the Lord the center of your life. Live out your faith. Share it with your children. Have a faith that is open and growing. Your children need to see real faith, real commitment. Many children don't see that today. What they have is a said faith from their parents. It's a said faith. The parents say, yeah, I, I believe in God. Yes, this family is Christian. But I put you in soccer. I'm hoping you'll get some kind of scholarship. And so we're going to make sure that you're in your so soccer tournaments. And even if it means we have to drive to Nevada, Arizona, or whatever for that tournament, and it's a Sunday, well, we'll have devotions, and we never do. And because hopefully you're going to be able to get a scholarship one day. And there are millions of kids out there who are, who are wanting to have scholarships and pray, uh, play pro ball and all who never will. And we lost our opportunities to evangelize our children because we taught them that there are more important things in life than following God. There are a whole lot of families who have given up their children to the altar of sports. Thousands, millions, Christians, people who said they loved the Lord, but they loved the sport more. 
and the kid, guess what they're going to do? They're going to follow your example, not what you're saying, but what you did. And so how do they know that you love the Lord? He says, love God with all your heart. The heart is the inner being, the origin of all thoughts, words, and deeds. Love God with all your soul. That's the seed of all emotional activity. Love God with all your strength. Serve the Lord. Now, heart, soul, and strength, well, that, that occurs, that model occurs through example, explanation, and enforcement. Example. My priorities are the things that they are going to see. Many of my priorities are things I don't even know I have. They're unconscious. What I watch, where I go, what I read, the language that I use, what is valuable to me is seen by them. And by the way, they are watching. I was talking to my son David. David's 40 years old. And I was talking to my David the other day. And I said to him, you know, Dave, mom and I are not real, what's the word? We're not real demonstrative in our, our love. You know, I'm not that guy that makes out with his girlfriend on the beach. That's not me. I, I get sick when I see that. I want to throw cold water on him. I'm not that guy. Marie and I don't dress up alike. You know, we both wear red and black, and we kind of walk like Tweedledee and Tweedledum. That's not us. You know, when we're together, we're together, but we're not clinging to one another everywhere we go like, like it's a body with two heads. We're not that way. So I'm telling my son, I'm saying, you know, your mom and I, we're not real demonstrative, and he starts to laugh. My son smiles and laughs. He says, that's not true, Dad. I said, what? He goes, that's not true. He said, you're very demonstrative with Mom. And I looked at him. I said, no, I'm not. He said, Dad. Now, Marie and I are sitting on the couch there in the front room. He says, look, my foot is on her foot. And he said, Dad, you always do that. Anytime Mama's near you, you move your foot so that's touching her. Every time. And I said, really? Really? He goes, yeah. And then it hit me. That's right. That's true. At night, when we're going to sleep, I move my hand to find her hand, and I'll hold on to it. I just do that, but I don't think of it. So to me, I'm not doing anything. To him, I'm a model. I'm telling you, that's what's happening with you. Your, your, your kids, if you're a parent... And they're still growing. Even now at 40, they see you. They, they see how you talk. They see how you look. I mean, when Marie walks into a room and I'm there and my son sees, even if she was there a moment ago, I'll look at her. I always do the same thing. I always just, just love her with my eyes. I always do. I just, I just love her with my eyes. My mom used to use that phrase, just love her with your eyes. And I do. And people will know when my girl walked in the room. They'll know. They don't even have to know who she is, the way I look at her when she comes in. And my kids have seen that. Your kids are watching you too. They're watching you. This is how a man loves a woman. This is how a man treats a wife. This is how a man treats the mother of his children. They watch you. You can all day long tell them how much they ought to respect mom. And then you get mad at her and yell at her in front of the kids. And they say, yeah, that's love. Letting her know who I am and that's love. No, no. You're teaching them the wrong things. And they're watching you. And I still remember when Marie and I, we would put our kids to bed at 9 o'clock. And sometimes when time change came, it would came, it'd still be light outside. And they'd be laying there and... We didn't watch TV. We didn't watch TV till they went to bed. We would let them see Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune or maybe, maybe something like that educational, but we didn't, they didn't grow up with that. When they went to bed, then Marie and I would sit down in the front room and we would watch whatever program we watched. And I can still remember that my son, I would see my son, I'd hear a sound, then I'd see a shadow, and they would be crawling 
Did your kids ever do that? They would crawl up the hall and like I didn't hear them, you know. And they'd look to see what we were watching. They would look to see what we were watching. And they would listen to the sound of the program. We used to have what was called a three-strike rule. If there was a profanity, mild profanity, I'd turn to the boys, strike one, strike two, it's out. Then that was it, no more. They learned that. They learned that. They watched. And to this day, they remember those things. Because I knew that I explain, but I also know that I example. They're going to be what I am, not just what I say. And that, to me, has been a very important thing. Now, as far as explanation is concerned, there are conversations. You have your, your devotion. Sit down with your kid. Open the Bible. Read a scripture. Pray with them. You don't have to give them a 40-minute sermon. You just open the Bible, and you read to them. And you say, God wants us to love one another, or God wants, this is what we'll do. You pray with them. Our children were raised with that. Sometimes they'll ask questions, and you, when you have the opportunity, you share. You take time to know them. You know who they are. You know who their friends are. You begin to ask, what are your hopes? What are your plans? What are your dreams? And you have conversations and explanations go along with that. I once read that kids who live with their parents spend less than 30 minutes a week in meaningful conversation with their mother. A week, 30 minutes, and 15 minutes per week with their dads. So you show an interest in them. You visit with them. You laugh with them. Sometimes you may even, you may even cry with them, which I have done with my children many times. You take walks. You enjoy devotions. You pray you invest in conversation that brings scripture to life. You talk about God's purpose. You hug them. You kiss them. Yes, I kiss my sons. I kiss my grandsons. You love them. You monitor their time on their phones, the computers, their video games. And you teach them the importance of a commitment to God and to a church. And then you enforce the discipline in the home while you can. When a home rule is violated, you discipline in a reasonable way. You appeal to Scripture, and you keep it as the foundation. And finally, build your home into a sanctuary. Transform your home into a church. Would you let a murderer or a rapist, a profane, belligerent, violent person in your home to invade? Be careful what you let in through the Internet, through the cable, through TV, through the radio, printed page. Be careful who you allow in your home because these violent, criminal, blasphemous people enter in through movies, through radio, and through your television set, and through the computer. There's nothing wrong with making sure that your home remains pure and set apart for God. As a matter of fact, that's the right thing to do because your children will learn that faith isn't something that's shown just once in a while. Faith is something you live every day. And when they understand that, you may be raising a child who will serve the Lord. The toughest thing you have to do in life as a parent, really, is to give your faith to your kids because they have wills of their own. And they're going to do what they want. But when you live for Jesus in such a way that shows he is so good, your children will say, I want to have the God of my Father. I want to follow Jesus Christ. And at the end, that is the most important thing that you will ever have is the faith of God in your home. I pray the study was encouraging, and I want to thank you for your continued support and prayers and invite you to join us next Sunday night as we move into the next part of our study. As I mentioned earlier, if you would like to give your offering, you can do so online. If you're using a computer, click on the Give button in the upper right corner of your screen. If you're watching on your mobile device or iPad, click Give under the Menu button. If this is your first time giving digitally, follow the instruction under Four Ways to Give to process your gift. And finally, you can either mail your checks to 12205 North Pipeline Avenue, Chino, California, 91710, or... If you're able, you can come to the sanctuary and use the kiosk we have in the foyer that are set up to process gifts. 
You can also place your gift in an envelope, hand it to one of the receptionists in the foyer. So thank you. God be with you. And we look forward to having you with us once again.